All right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, hello. Good evening, Indonesia. Good morning, Tampa, Florida. Good morning, USA. Good day for our friend from the rest of the world. It must be evening, night in Pacific, Australia, New Zealand. Afternoon and evening now in Asia. Morning now in Europe, Africa. Early morning in North America, Central America, and South America. First and foremost, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to this international webinar that is attended by participants from 62 countries of six continents around the globe. We are gathering now this day, all nations, citizens of the world, to be united for helping the people against blindness. Welcome to our 20th episode of Distinguished Maestro Lecture. I am Gede Pardianto from Indonesia. Let's start the webinar. To honor the origin country of this webinar, please pay attention to Indonesian National Anthem. Now, to honor the origin country of our distinguished speaker, please pay attention to American National Anthem. so much ladies and gentlemen our great maestro this time will be dr john stephen jarsta 
a legend, a grandmaster, my American brother, an old good friend of Indonesia, the man, an inventor, multiple awards winning, a great surgeon and best cataract surgeon in the USA. Abang John, my brother, is a professor of clinical ophthalmology, vice chairman of ophthalmology residency director at the University of South Florida, Morsani School of Medicine, Tampa, the capital of the state of Florida, the United States of America. John was a professor of clinical ophthalmology, and he was also adjunct professor at Pacific Northwest University and Washington University. And he was an assistant professor of clinical ophthalmology as past president of Washington Academy of Eye Physician and Surgeon. He served on several charity projects around the world, including USNS Mercy in Southeast Asia and USNS Comfort in Ecuador. He is visiting professor in Indonesia, Austria, the Philippines, North Korea, Vietnam, Kyrgyzstan, Cambodia, Zimbabwe, Egypt, Angola, Nigeria, Madagascar, and England, where he was elected to the Royal Society of Medicine in 2006. John is human, a normal man also, as he is city of Federal Way favorite, outstanding community volunteer, fishing lover, U.S. Merson Marine Captain, music player, bass, guitar, harp, friends horn, and piano. He also cinematographer, and he won Okuski Slalom Medalist at First Eye Doctor World Ski Championship in Cortina, Italy, and Astar Alpin Ski Racing Silver Medalist. And he speaks German, Bahasa Indonesia, Korean, Russian, Norwegian, and Medical Spanish, and Porsche English. John has numerous invention, patterns of the instruments, the pocket peco machine, small incision Missouri manual cataract extractor, iridectomy punch, jar start stone teasing head, cataract surgery simulator, outstanding innovator and inventor in American Surgical Instrument Company, inventor, designer, siren, boss and long passport one and design consultant of MO Prodigy. John Jarstad has been awarded with multiple awards. Who's who among business and health professionals? Electorals Medal from University of Indonesia School of Medicine. Surgical Innovators Award for Jarstad Refractive Cataract Surgery Incision Marker from American Surgical Instrument Company. Outstanding and Effective Teacher Award in Ophthalmology by Mayo Medical School, Rochester, Minnesota, USA. And Newsweek, Top 15 National White Leader in Laser Eye Surgery. And also, ASCRS David and Victoria Chang Award for Humanitarian Service. Outstanding Intellectual of the 21st Century from IBC, Cambridge, England, Washington Academy of Eye Physician and Surgeon Humanitarian of the Year, King County Council, Seattle Metro, Commendation for International Humanitarian Work, Sister Dora Award for Cost Efficiency in Cataract Surgery from St. Francis Hospital. He recently named as the best surgeon of the nation in the United States of America. He has published more than 100 papers at international meetings, journals, and books. And now he is going to deliver the Maestro Lecture to hundreds of participants from more than 62 countries of six continents around the world. Wow, that is so astonishing. At this very moment, he will present at the very important topic, and it will be 
a really interesting topic. Now we are learning from the man who is a grand maestro on this field. So be prepared. Fellow ophthalmologists, let's pay attention to Professor John Jarsta. So John, we are counting down for you. Five, four, three, two, one. Time is yours. Lift off. Don't keep John Stephen Jarsta. All right. Thank you, Dr. Pariento, and uh, Slamat Malam, and um, I am very honored and happy to be here. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, are you able to see my slide? I hope so. Yeah, we see, but okay. not slide two. Great. Okay. All right. So this is a photo of our hospital complex. Uh, they have many donors and in uh, just the last six months, they merged with the medical school along with the largest hospital in this area. And uh, they asked me uh, to be the director, co-director of all outpatient surgery, not just eye surgery. So that was a, uh, a challenge. Uh, what are the common complications from cataract surgery? Uh, IOP spike on the first post-op day and cystoid macular edema are the, uh, the two most common complications. Um, I have some uh, questions I would like to answer today for us. Uh, number one, are NSAIDs really necessary uh, in cataract surgery? Uh, second, how can I eliminate endophthalmitis from my practice? Third, is there anything that can cure ophthalmic and classic migraine that I haven't thought of? Uh, and uh, how can I repair an iris defect without making the patient worse? So these are the topics that I'll cover today. Are NSAIDs really necessary if the pressure is adjusted immediately following surgery? Uh, can dietary riboflavin and sunlight help in the treatment of keratoconus and post-refractive ectasia? I have some ideas on post-op antibiotic use and they'll show you the fisherman's knot for iris repair after traumatic iris injury and some unusual cataract cases if we have time. Um, first of all, is uh, immediate reduction of intraocular pressure important in reducing the uh, complications? And are perioperative NSAIDs really necessary if the pressure is adjusted immediately after cataract surgery? These are the current three methods of uh, uh, in the operating room to check the pressure following cataract surgery. The standard of care currently is to tap on the eye with a Wexel or, or a Q-tip and say, well, it's not too firm, not too soft, the pressure must be safe. There's two other ways that you can use to check the pressure. One is a Barricare surgical tonometer, which produces two rings. The inner ring is uh, a pressure of 21 and the outer ring is a pressure of 16. So if the meniscus falls between the inner and the outer ring, that's a, a good normal pressure. And then of course the tono pen, which with a sterile cover, you can check and adjust the pressure. I call the current method of checking pressure um, uh, the Goldilocks method. As you recall, maybe from the story, children's storybook, uh, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, the little girl found that the uh, bed, one bed was too soft, one was too hard, and the other was just right. So at the conclusion of cataract surgery, um, we test the pressure by palpation and think that the pressure must be safe, but is that really true? So our purpose was to determine the accuracy of palpation and predicting pressure immediately after cataract surgery with either femtosecond laser cataract surgery or microincision surgery, and then check and see if it had any effect on uh, pressure and CME. So our test, uh, our study, we had 908 routine femto laser assisted cataract surgeries and microincision surgeries between 2016 and 2018 without the use of NSAIDs during a time of shortage. The pressure was checked before and adjusted immediately after cataract surgery and the pressure was repeated on the day one post-op as we normally all do. Cystoid macular edema was measured in patients who did not correct to 2020 or 1.0 and confirmed with the serous OCT of the macula. These are some graphs showing the um, results. 
The first graph in the upper left here uh, shows the, uh, the comparison between palpation versus actual checking with the tono pen. And you can see it looks like a scatter plot. There's no correlation at all. The second graph up here shows the correlation between the surgical tonometer uh, versus the tono pen. And then this uh, graph down here shows the difference between what the estimation was by palpation and the actual measurement. And what's concerning is out here, we had about 10 cases where there was at least a 30 millimeter difference between what we thought was a safe pressure and what the actual pressure was. And then this final graph shows the difference between the Barracare surgical tonometer and the tono pen. So it's much less expensive to use the Barracare tonometer than the tono pen. Um, so uh, when we thought pressure was safe by feel or palpation, the pressure actually ranged from nine to 67 when verified with sonometry. There was less than a five millimeter uh, pressure change from immediately post-op in the OR to one day post-op in the clinic. As many as 33% of post-op patients on a given surgical day without pressure adjustment in the operating theater required a one day post-op adjustment versus less than 5% if we adjusted the pressure on the table. John, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, could you uh, use a slideshow in the mode of upper left? Upper left. Yeah, upper left, upper, upper. Use slideshow. Uh -huh. Please, please. Uh, yeah. uh, up and left. The corner, in the corner. Use slideshow. Oh, okay. Sorry. There we go. Ah, uh, yeah. Perfect. Better? Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Carry on. Okay. So we noticed cystoid macular edema was found in 13 of 905 eyes for a rate of 1.4% of non diabetics and two of 25 diabetic patients. And the Cochrane analysis showed that there were uh, six studies with a total of 948 uh, patients. And it showed a rate of CME in prior studies from 1.2 to 4%. So what our conclusion is, is that perioperative NSAIDs may not be necessary in routine non-diabetic uh, eyes for femtolaser or microincision surgery, but perioperative NSAIDs are essential to prevent CME in diabetic patients. This finding should be correlated in future uh, controlled trials in your practice, and our findings in the largest study to date may save considerable expense to patients and the healthcare systems. Uh, this is a video that's going to show our technique for using the pressure adjustment in surgery. This is our technique showing the immediate adjustment of intraocular pressure after cataract surgery. Here we're hydrating the incision. We're going to test the pressure by tapping on the eye, it's too firm. We do a quick double tap through the paracentesis and then we'll check the pressure with a tunnel pen using a sterile cover. And we find the pressure is safe every time. And we totally kill high pressure every time with the double tap. One other interesting finding we found was that um, there was an economic benefit to adjusting the pressure in the operating theater. And uh, we had a uh, industrial engineer calculate that for us and it was found to be about $44,000 per uh, American IMD per year in lost opportunity costs if you don't have to check and, and adjust the pressure the next day by burping the incision in the, in the clinic. Uh, we found that immediate post-op pressure is impossible to predict accurately by palpation, but improves with practice and immediate verification with tonometry. There's no statistically significant difference in reaching a safe pressure when using an inexpensive uh, handheld barricade tonometer compared to a $4,000 tono pen, although uh, many surgeons prefer the tono pen with a sterile cover. Immediate adjustment of post-op pressure in the operating theater allows safe pressure following cataract surgery, prevents post-op uh, pressure spikes, which is the number one complication of cataract surgery. It improves the predictability of pressure, provides protection against CME, and provides some cost savings. It also eliminates catastrophic events. And I have seen a couple of patients that were referred for second opinions that had compression optic neuropathy and blindness from pressure being too high overnight. My second topic is, can anything be done to stabilize post RKIs following cataract surgery or uh, prior to it? Uh, and this study involves megadose dietary riboflavin in the treatment of keratoconus and post-refractive surgery ectasia. 
And um, this was presented initially at the International Crosslinking Conference in Zurich, Switzerland, which is a great meeting if you are interested in crosslinking. Um, and these are my disclosures of the other investigators on our team. Um, I have no financial interest in this. Uh, as we all know, keratoconus is a progressive eye disease, which the normally round cornea thins and begins to bulge into a cone-like cone shape. And this cone deflects light as it enters the eye and causes distortion. There's no known cause or reason for the occurrence of keratoconus that's been proven. Many experts believe that excessive eye rubbing could lead to this condition. It's estimated to occur in one out of 2,000 people. The incidence in Egypt may be the highest in the world due to people marrying into a wealthy family of autosomal dominant keratoconus patients. And my good friend, Dr. Ahmed Hatoud, who was in Cairo, now he's in the US, he said, I was often performing more than 100 corneal transplant operations per month for keratoconus when he was in Cairo. Uh, this is the lobster claw appearance that we see on topography. And so I'd like to present two cases. The initial case in 2008 was a nice lady in Seattle who provided the inspiration for our study and a more recent case from 2017. Both cases showed progressive steepening followed by significant cornea flattening with improvement in distortion and best corrected acuity after treatment. Our first lady, our patient was a 64 year old female who had a history of cataract surgery and previous LASIK before her cataract surgery. Following cataract surgery, she had a PRK enhancement for astigmatism and developed progressive ectasia with her best corrected vision of 2040 or 0.5. Her K, uh, made, K average was 46.87 and she had the following uh, refractive error and pachymetry was 419. Uh, in discussing with her some treatment options, we talked about uh, the possibility of deep lamellar anterior keratoplasty, a rigid contact lens, cross-linking, or do nothing and just wear glasses. And she elected to go with cornea cross-linking with the vidro and riboflavin uh, with epi off and using the Dresden protocol, the cornea epithelium is scraped, concentrated riboflavin supplied, a vidro uh, machine, UV light is applied for 20 minutes and a bandaged contact lens is placed. This is the machine that does the cross-linking in the US, the Avidro system. And this is uh, the cornea after the epithelium has been removed and riboflavin has been applied. As you can see from this uh, in, in vitro uh, example, the cornea is stiffened by the, by the uh, riboflavin and ultraviolet. When we explained this to the patient that at the time it was not covered by insurance and it would be $3,500 per treatment eye, uh, which the uh, company uh, recommended, she broke down emotionally and cried and said she couldn't afford one eye, let alone two, and did we have anything cheaper and less painful? And um, so Plato said necessity was the mother of invention. So I thought, well, I guess you could just take uh, riboflavin pills and then for the ultraviolet, go out in the sun for, I don't know, 15 minutes a day without sunglasses. And I called the Linus Pauling Institute in Oregon and they said there's not been any uh, toxicity at any level of taking riboflavin because it's water soluble. So this is a uh, topography pre and post treatment after six months, she came back six months later and her keratometry readings went from 47 to 45 after six months. Let's see if I can move that out of the way. There we go. So that was quite a shock. So I asked her, what did you do? Did you take more than I said? Are we out in the sun longer? She says, well, you told me to take 50 milligrams of riboflavin per day. So I thought if 50 milligrams was good, 500 would be better. So she'd been taking 500 milligrams of riboflavin and been in the sun 15 minutes a day for six months. Uh, other patients after this experience, we began treating, and one particular one that was pretty amazing was a lady who had radial keratotomy surgery years before and had uh, such fluctuations, she had to wear two pairs of glasses, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, because her vision changed so much. And after six months of treatment, uh, she uh, improved from 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 vision. This is a graph showing the uh, results of the treatment. Um, between 100 milligrams, 400 milligrams. And we had actually two patients who doubled up their treatment and took 800. And this shows the flattening and diopters of their cornea. This one outlier patient here was a patient who refused to remove his contact lenses, his hard contact lenses when he went outside and he had no effect and actually um, had progression. 
he served as kind of an unintentional control. The second patient was a 56 year old uh, gentleman who was diabetic and presented with progressive blurring of vision and irregular astigmatism. His best corrected vision was 2040. He had uh, astigmatism in a vertical angle, uh, significantly in the left. And um, his exam showed iron lines in both eyes, clear stroma, some stria, and topography showed inferior steepening in the left eye greater than the right. We discussed the options for treatment and he hadn't tolerated context in the past, so he decided to go with our clinical trial. These are uh, two uh, topographies showing uh, what, what shows to be a reduction pre and, and post treatment of about six tenths of a diopter in, in the left eye, or sorry, in the right eye. And the, the significant thing I thought was the posterior float improved from 67 diopters to 54 diopters. And that apex of the cone shifted from a temporal to, um, or sorry, from one side to more centralized. So his results, uh, pre-op, he noticed a teardrop distortion when he shot his gun hunting. He said those symptoms had resolved. His visual acuity went from 2030 and 2025 to 2020 and 2015. His uh, K-Max I mentioned reduced, topography showed less steepening and his axis went more towards the center. And this is the patient's um, testimonial. Taken a rat in the last approximately six months. Um, the uh, scope crosshairs are sharpening to truer lines. Um, uh, I have a, a red dot scope that uh, was getting like clusters of grapes effect. And that is, is diminishing to be more of a true dot. Uh, at night, uh, instead of really flame-like flares of light, it's uh, becoming more of a thread, a series of threads. Uh, so it's narrowing down yes. those, uh, that normal light image. Uh, we proceeded to do a clinical trial with uh, NIH and uh, treated 27 eyes. Um, and found the average flattening was 1.3 diopters, which compares very favorably to the commercial Avidro treatment and two lines of improvement. Our protocol involved cross-linking with megadose riboflavin of 400 milligrams a day and sunlight of 15 minutes. Uh, I believe it may be a possible adjunct or alternative to Dresden Avidro protocol. And in uh, Brazil, the Cornea Society there has uh, decided to use this as a first-line treatment for patients with keratoconus and ectasia. Patients were randomized in our study to 100 or 400 milligrams, as I mentioned, uh, sunlight exposure. We also found in a lot of the research studies that oxygen helps with the cross-linking. So we asked them to walk briskly facing the sun between the hours of 10 a.m. and two. No sunglasses, glasses, or contact lenses, and the results uh, showed one to two diopters of flattening at six to 12 months. Uh, applying this to other uh, diseases, we found that uh, it's been helpful in children with progressive myopia. And then also uh, uh, an unusual finding was that patients returned for their three month follow-up in our study for keratoconus we were asking, hey, this high dose riboflavin, is it supposed to cure my migraines? And I said, well, tell me more. And they said, well, I haven't had any since I began the cornea study. So to date we've treated over 200 ophthalmic and classic migraine patients with only two patients who said it did not help. Uh, and there was some literature that showed success in treating children uh, with high dose dietary riboflavin of 400 milligrams a day. Our early observations was that 400 milligrams plus seems to show the greatest effect. Oxygen has a beneficial effect. Dr. Saylor in Switzerland had commented to me after my presentation there that he observed Swiss Air Force pilots with early keratoconus were taking riboflavin and playing tennis to keep their vision qualifications and continue flying. Hard contact lens wear prevents cross-linking uh, and successful patient uh, regressed after going to a night shift. And one patient took 1500 milligrams a day. She was a clinical dietitian, showed no adverse effects. There was a 1944 paper showing high doses of B2 uh, were found in the mouse cornea uh, by a dietary means. This is Dr. Saylor and some Swiss Air Force pilots. And you can see where they would be playing tennis at high altitude and would be exposed to the ultraviolet. And he thought it was the, um, 
the high altitude that was doing the the uh, cross-linking or the, the stabilization. And he was right. It was that and then the riboflavin that they were taking. Uh, in summary, commercial cross-linking is very effective at treating peritoconus and ectasia. There may be this benefit to megadose dietary riboflavin in pediatric and pregnant patients who are prone to regression or for those patients unable to pay the high cost of cross-linking. Further studies should, are necessary and are ongoing to show whether younger patients will benefit from dietary riboflavin and to determine the optimum treatment regimen. Uh, the third topic is post-op antibiotic ideas. In the 1990s, some studies showed that most cataract incisions leaked from the wound edges, not from the center. In 1993, I designed a cataract surgery marker that was one millimeter wider on the edges than in the center to eliminate this wound leak problem. In addition, I began infiltrating the inner edges of the wound with preservative-free moxifloxacin rather than simply injecting it into the anterior chamber where it would disappear within 20 minutes. In over 25,000 cases of cataract surgery, there have been no cases of endophthalmitis. And this is a, a technique that um, I actually learned in Indonesia, uh, where I'm going to show a jet wash of the anterior chamber, along with um, the hydration of the wound. Okay, there we go. So this is immediately uh, post-op after the IOL is placed in the eye. And this is a uh, BSS on a 27 gauge cannula. And we're just going to irrigate the anterior chamber angle on both sides. And I call this a, a poor man's SLT or a jet wash is what they referred to it in Indonesia when I was shown this. And then now we will hydrate the incision. And this is with moxifloxacin, which has no preservative. And so we're going to force that into the edges of the incision where some rabbit studies have shown that that antibiotic persists for sometimes up to three weeks after injection like this, as opposed to uh, disappearing in 20 minutes. Uh, the next topic is about uh, fisherman's knot for iris repair. It's useful for traumatic injuries and poor pupil constriction. And also if you uh, encounter trauma during FACO. Uh, I did spend some time as a Coast Guard licensed charter boat captain. And so this is where I learned the fisherman's knot. Uh, in history, Malcolm McCannell in, in uh, Minneapolis in 1976 described a transcorneal retrievable suture for iris trauma, originally used to refix or resuture stabilized sublux posterior chamber lenses. Stephen Seepser modified the McCannell suture in 2005. And then as we were in Indonesia in 2012 on the Mercy, we had a case where we needed a to suture the iris and neither one of us could remember the seeps or not or the mechanical suture. So we developed the fisherman's knot. And then Dr. Mandaji in um, Indonesia uh, developed a low cost simulator that you can use, which I'll show you in a moment. This is uh, showing pupillary cerclage to suture that. You then reach in and pull a loop of the suture back twist it five times, and then place the needle, uh, which is on uh, this end, through that loop and pull the ends. And this is a uh, video showing the fisherman's knot or the clinch knot. So this is used to place hooks that will hold uh, 20 kilogram fish easily. The uh, leader or the line of the fishing line will go through the loop of the hook that's twisted around five times. And then that free end is placed through the loop. And then both ends are pulled securely. And it's a really uh, very strong knot and it doesn't untie or it doesn't break. So this is our video of uh, showing this technique. It's defect, it's not. Model. This is an enlarged model to simulate suturing of the iris with the fisherman's knot. We pass our needle through the iris defect, reach in with a Sinsky hook or iris hook, and withdraw a loop of suture. The loop is twisted five times, and the needle is passed through the loop of the suture. This is then pulled securely and gently with each end. 
securing the fisherman's knot. We always leave a locking throw behind, so we reach in and withdraw another loop of suture, twist this twice, and then pass the tenno proline needle through the loop one last time. Both ends are pulled gently to secure the fisherman's knot, and it creates a very strong knot that will not untie. And this is an example of a patient uh, in Indonesia that we treated who had an iris coloboma. Uh, at birth, and we use the fisherman's knot to uh, correct that. So a couple of pearls with suture repair of the iris. Perfect can be the enemy of very good. Be prepared and ready to start your case with tenoproline on a CIF4 needle or Gore-Tex suture. A retrobobal block or general anesthesia is really essential in this type of patient because any sudden patient movement can be a disaster. <clears throat> be quick, get in and get out, and stop anticoagulants for a week. And just remember what I tell my residents is sometimes what they have is better than what they could end up with. Um, the final uh, part of this lecture, I'm going to demonstrate some difficult cases in cataract surgery uh, that occurred in the last couple of years. There are six cases to consider. Number one, the forgetful patient, second, uh, second opinion, the almost femto failure, a very thorny issue and the hyperopic surprise. And then finally, the anxious law student emergency. So the forgetful patient, this is a 75 year old male who uh, had claimed he had no previous eye history or surgery, and he now has glare and halos at night. He was referred by a local doctor to the university for a dense cortical cataract in the right eye. His best corrected vision was 0 0.1 and his pressure was normal. Slip map exam showed what appeared to be a dense three plus cortical cataract, and uh, we scheduled him for surgery. This is the video of his surgery. Here we're making a, a, a little larger incision. And you can see because the lens appeared or the cataract appeared to be loose, we thought maybe there were loose sonules and we should take the cataract out and place it in the anterior chamber. But as we were looking in, we saw what looked like a lens haptic in the eye. So we grasped that and withdrew it through the incision. And here we have a posterior chamber lens that had been completely clouded over. Uh, with fibrosis and what appeared to be some cortical remnants. And this is placing an anterior chamber lens in. Uh, and this patient did really well afterwards. The second case is a case of a, a second opinion. This was a 65 year old lady who presented for second opinion after routine cataract surgery at another institution she said was unsuccessful. And I asked, why was the surgery unsuccessful? Do you know? She said, all the doctor could tell me was that he couldn't remove my cataract and that he'd never seen anything like my eye before. So he said he just had to give up. And this is a, a case of a duplicated anterior capsule. Here's my incision marker that you can see is a little wider on the edges than in the center. We went in and you can see this outline of a perfect capsulorexis and then the capsule, second capsule is still intact. So we use that for kind of a, a stencil or a template. We did another capsulotomy and the patient did really fine. The third case is a 67-year-old um, Korean-American lady with tight orbital fissures. We were unable to dock the Lensex femtolaser and I explained to the family we'd have to proceed with standard FACO. The daughter said, that's not acceptable. We paid for bladeless laser cataract surgery, so you must do it. And once again, uh, Plato has said that necessity is the mother of invention, so we came up with the idea of uh, using some paper clips where we bend the tips on those and use those to uh, provide better opening of the eye. This is on a different patient, but it shows how we can uh, dock the femto laser if we can open the eye with these uh, sterilized paper clips. Case number four, a thorny issue. This is a 31 year old male woodsman who slipped and fell down a cliff. He slid 100 meters and landed in a blackberry thicket, and he developed some pain in his left eye. He saw his local eye doctor who prescribed antibiotic drops for pink eye. After two weeks, he was not improving, so he was referred to the university for chronic conjunctivitis. Uh, he actually had up under his upper eyelid a blackberry thorn, and we first made an incision, like a standard phaco incision, and tried to pull the thorn into the eye, but it wouldn't come. So finally, we grasped the thorn with some uh, 0.3 forceps and just jerked it out of the eye. And there you can see the 
of the blackberry thorn. Uh, this patient wasn't too happy because we had to use three sutures to close his incision. And he developed quite a bit of astigmatism following this. And he uh, asked us, wouldn't it have been better if we just left that in the eye? So um, number five is the, is the hyperopic surprise. This was a 72 year old lady with an unexpected three and a half uh, diopter hyperopic result from her surgery and um, elsewhere. And she was unhappy with the anisometropia and desired that we fix this eye before we went ahead with her right eye. We talked to her about the options of an IOL exchange, LASIK and a piggyback IOL. We recalculated with the IOL master and confirmed the IOL should be 1.5 times the difference. So 1.5 times 3.5, we decided to use a five diopter piggyback lens and agreed that this would be the safest and best way to go. This is the video showing the implantation of this piggyback lens. But every time, uh, not every time do things go smoothly. You can see that as that lens went in, the haptic here was amputated and missing. And so we had to enlarge the incision a little bit, remove this uh, damaged IOL, and then we were able to place uh, a regular lens through that larger opening. Didn't really trust that injector again. Our, our, um, our final case is a 22-year-old um, law student who, was, uh, who presented right before finals. And she had um, microphthalmus in her other eye. So this was her only seeing eye. And it was two weeks before finals, her vision was 2100, her other eye was light projection only, had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. The university, she said, was going to hire a reader for her, for her finals. She said, can you please help me? Otherwise I'll fail law school. And so um, this, is an ex this is her um, her surgery. That's our marker showing the, uh, showing our incision. We have our paracentesis opening. We inject some more lidocaine with epinephrine. It doesn't move the pupil hardly at all. So we decide to go in through this tunneled incision. And I always like to flare the inside edges so that they're a little bit longer to prevent wound leak. We try iris hooks to stretch the pupil. And that helps a little bit but still it's not adequate. So we decide to insert some grease hover iris hooks. So those are placed and that gives us a little better dilation, but it's still not real comfortable operating on that small of a, of a pupil. So we place, in addition to the iris hooks, we place a seven millimeter Malugan ring. And this provided adequate um, pupil dilation. We stained the capsule with vision blue dye. Here's our capsulectomy. And uh, you can see there's some fibrosis or calcifications here in this area, which were so uh, dense, we had to cut those with the scissors. I actually saw a case like this um, in North Korea, which was pretty similar. A lady had cataract for 30 years and her capsule had turned so uh, calcified that it was just like bone to try to get that out. Here's we're, go we're going ahead with the standard FACO. It's a very soft uh, nucleus because the patient's 22 years old. We finish that. We do our cortical cleanup. I take out the Malugan ring, which it took me seven years to figure out you can remove it best by dialing it counterclockwise and it will remove the leaves. And then that's re removed and then we inject the, uh, the new lens. Uh, her first post-op day, she was uh, 0 0.5 or 2040. And she was able to sit for her law school finals a week later. And she was able to pass her law school boards and um, is now a practicing public defender in Kansas City, Missouri. I'd like to say to Rima Kasi Sakali, thank you for your kind invitation and this great honor, and thank you for your attention. Be happy to take any questions.
All right. Thank you so much, Professor. What a lecture, John. Incredible presentation. Phil Ophthalmologies, now we are approaching the question and answer session. John, please open the question and answer so you can read the answer. Uh, read the question, every question, and answer each question. Please, John. Please unmute. Yep. Uh, let's see. I am looking for a question here. Yeah. I don't see anything. Hmm. Maybe I can assist you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Excuse me, Professor. Have you ever give no NSAID at all when you did cataract surgery to your patient? In your experience, what happened to your patient? Thank you. Yeah, so um, uh, if we did not, it, we normally would use it based on a study in 1989 that showed a much lower incidence of cystoid macular edema. But in that 1989 study, they didn't stra stratify the, the patients between diabetic and non-diabetic patients. So uh, they showed a, a lower incidence of CME if NSAIDs were used, but that was not breaking it up. So our study, I thought, was uh, helpful because it showed that when we could not get NSAIDs, or if NSAIDs are too expensive for patients, which they are in the U.S. many times, um, then you really don't need them in a routine cataract case. But in diabetics, absolutely, we've got to use them because patients would get CME uh, very commonly, uh, more than four times more than the average patient. So. Uh, I think it's important to use them in diabetics. I still do, but we've stopped using them routinely in the routine cataract operations. Thank you so much, Professor. The next question, it is inter uh, interesting, Professor, about using the riboflavin vitamin. Excuse me, if i curious to know uh, the background of your idea about using uh, by two vitamin and why the dose is uh, 50 milligrams, and how if we give until the dose is more than uh, 500 milligrams of riboflavin? Thank you in advance for your answer. Right, so I just picked an arbitrary number because 50 milligrams was the highest I ever saw on a B-complex vitamin bottle. And so the patient asked me how much riboflavin should she take? I said 50 milligrams. Come to find out, her taking 10 times that level uh, was kind of the magic number because patients with 400 milligrams, which is the, the largest amount you can buy in the United States and from a vitamin company is 400 milligram capsules. And so uh, she was taking five of the 100 milligrams. It comes in 100 or 500. And she was doing that for six months. Well, that uh, 400 seems to be the magic dose. That level or above seems to get into the cornea best, and that's what will do the cross-linking. So that's how, that's how we determine that. That's a good question. All right, thank you so much. The next question will be, thank you, Professor. Is there any correlation between high IOP on day one with the patient's age? Uh, well, we found that the pressure on the first post-op day, we almost never see a, a post-op spike now on the first day post-op. So we will actually even operate on a Friday and check the pressure at the end. Like yesterday, I operated on six patients at a hospital, county hospital, and uh, we adjusted the pressure to 12, and then we will see them on Monday. But we, we found that that opens up an extra day of surgery because the pressure doesn't go up. And if it does, it's a very low pressure spike, maybe to 30. I was always taught in residency, uh, I asked the question to my professor. I said, why do patients have a high pressure the first day after surgery? Is it from retained viscoelastic? And he said, no, that can't be it. Because he said, we had pressure spikes before viscoelastic was even invented. And so he said, maybe you can solve that problem someday. And so I kept thinking about that. And then we measure everything so precisely in our field. I thought, gosh, we're just 
palpating the eye after cataract surgery, when someone could have a high pressure, we have ability to check it now. Why don't we just use a tonal pen or this pressure ring? And what we found was amazing. I have my residents estimate what they think the pressure is at the end of a case, and then we verify it with the tonal pen. And uh, some of them are very close, and some of them are way off. There'll be uh, pressures of 60 when they think it's, it's normal. So that's, that's what I think. And the pressure didn't vary from the OR to the next day by more than five points. Thank you so much, Professor. The next question will be, how fast and how strong the jet was? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, I place it fairly close to the angle and uh, <laughs> there's not a good way. That would be a good study to see how much uh, pressure, you know, pressure transducer added to the syringe. But I would say a moderate, injection kind of like when you're hydro dissecting and you have a lens you're trying to get out of the bag uh, that amount of, of pressure and i have been too close to the angle i think you should be at least a couple millimeters away and not uh, place your cannula right in the angle i had a case uh, wednesday where i actually caused some bleeding because i got a little too close and so um, no harm done the patient was fine but i'm optimistic that this technique I learned in Indonesia will help patients who are borderline for glaucoma or uh, uh, may have glaucoma, that it will help keep the pressure down. It's like a SLT. And uh, we're, our study, we're, we're randomizing it. We're, we're doing it with one, one eye with the jet wash versus the other eye that has cataract surgery without the jet wash. And so we will have data on that uh, in two weeks when we have a residence day presentations. All right, thank you so much. The next question, Professor, will you tell us a little about cataract surgery in North Korea? What technique they perform, what microscope, and how many surgeons do you have? Okay, great. Yeah, so I was called up by this uh, Korean American Evangelical Christian Church from Houston, Texas, and they said, you teach cataract surgery around the world, would you go with us to North Korea? And I said, you mean South Korea? I said, they said, no, North. I said, I didn't think we could go there as Americans. He said, well, normally you can't, but as part of a mission group, you can. And so we went over and um, they had a FACO machine from China. It was a fairly compact one. Uh, they provided two nurses, uh, eye nurses from China who were very good, by the way. And um, they had an operating microscope they brought in, which had a fixed focus. You couldn't adjust the oculars. So the first day I had to operate standing up and then I went to the hospital carpenter and I said, hey, I measured 22 inches from uh, my eyes to where I could be sitting. And uh, could you build me a platform that's that size? So the next day, he, I thought he would just build a wooden box, but he had this beautiful upholstered box that he had and uh, brought it in. And so we put the surgeon's chair there and then we could operate. But uh, we did uh, some FACO and then a lot of uh, small incision M6 uh, extra cap surgeries. So that was the first time in Rajin, North Korea, that we were allowed to, uh, uh, to set up operating for cataracts. It's a beautiful hospital there that was built with donations. And um, they have a bakery on the side when the teams cannot be there to produce uh, roles for uh, keeping the staff employed. Um, I know whatever, whatever else you need to know, but one patient, it was interesting, we got donated lenses and one patient, uh, they did not have a keratometer. So I checked and averaged my Korean American patients K readings and found that the average keratometry was 44.5. So I used that in the IOL formula. And then we did have a pocket A scan to measure the axial length. So with that and 44.5, we get really great results. And I had one gentleman who could only see light when the sun came up and knew it was dark when the sun went down. And the first day post-op, he was 20, 25, 0 0.8. And he was so excited. He was jumping up and down and pointing to his other eye. He wanted his other eye done right away. And uh, he actually got a crystal lens, which was donated. And he ended up with 20, 25 distance and J2 at near. And he'd been blind for like 10 years. And he was so excited. He was told that he had an incurable disease and it. He, he, would, uh, he had to remain blind the rest of his life. That's what he was told. So it was a great trip. I went back a second time because I wanted to make sure 
uh, that my post-op patients were doing well. My wife thought I was crazy to go the first time, but um, uh, it was very, uh, it was very successful and I really enjoyed it. The people were wonderful. And I even got to meet Kim Jong-un, the dictator and had a game of billiards with him. And uh, I won't say who won. All I'll say was that I was ahead for a while and then he eventually won the match and said, I beat you just as I predicted, American. So it was fun. I'd like yeah. a rematch from those someday. Okay. That yeah. was so exciting. <laughs> and the next question uh, from Dr. Cliff Abs from Indonesia, which one's better, an SAD or steroid? according to you? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think some of that depends on the patient. I think in our country, steroids are less expensive. So we use steroids post-op. Uh, there's also a movement to inject steroids into the eye so that patients don't need drops. We call it dropless cataract surgery. And so I think that's uh, very safe now if you can hydrate the incision with your antibiotic, which will stay around a long time and then um, use the steroid injection into the eye with either a pellet or just a, a slow releasing one like Kenalog or uh, triessence. So that's, that's an option. And I, I think especially where patients, uh, the non-affordable pe persons, um, as you describe them, that would be a big benefit to them. If you can hydrate the incision with the preservative-free Vigamox or moxifloxacin, and then just inject a little bit of Kenalog or washed Kenalog or triessence, then they would not need eye drops and it would protect them from, you know, having to uh, get an infection or inflammation and be uh, much more economical. So that's something that maybe some of the younger doctors there can try and um, see if it works. Cause it seems to be working here. We've done that on several patients. Okay. Thank you so much for your kind answer. Great question. And the, next, the next question will be, Professor, what do you think if we only use Timolol eye drop after day one as preventive? Yeah, that's a great question because um, I used to use uh, Timolol or uh, an alpha adrenergic drop like uh, bromonidine for the first week after surgery. And um, now with adjusting the pressure in the OR, I found that I don't need to do that. So, um, but my routine in the past was at the end of the case, I would adjust the pressure and put a drop of Timolol in. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I found that uh, we probably don't need to do that if we adjust the pressure to a safe range. That's a great question. I, I completely agree with that and understand that if you're not gonna check the pressure afterwards, put the patient on a glaucoma drop. Thank you. The next question will be from Dr. Gadir al Humimat from Jordan. Can we do Fisherman's knot in a pachyc patient with traumatic pupil dilatation, but no cataract? Yes, that's a great question. I've done that on a couple of occasions. You have to be sure to place plenty of viscoelastic under the iris so you uh, avoid striking the lens. Um, but yes, it, it works just as well. So you just have to be very cautious and uh, you know, definitely do not, do not hit the iris. I like uh, docking the, the uh, long CIF4 needle with a 25 gauge needle from the other side and you push the needle into that and then pull it out with the 25 gauge needle on the other side. And, um, and then uh, on that, uh, you come in from the side where the needle is, you reach across, pull a loop of the suture, twist it five times outside the eye, and then place the needle through that loop and just pull the opposite ends. And there was a doctor in India after I gave this uh, keynote lecture there at the All India meeting, and he just uh, placed the one, uh, the, one suit, the one knot. He didn't place a back throw knot. He said that worked just as well. So... I haven't tried that. I'm a little fright, you know, afraid to do that. So I like to reach in and grab another loop and put a second, second knot in. Thank you so much, Professor. What have, what have set your interest in this medical discipline? 
I don't think I understand the question. Uh, what have saved? Oh. Yeah, your interest in this medical discipline. Yeah, so I have usually I give two answers. One is when I was five years old, I heard the song Three Blind Mice, and I felt so sad for those mice. Somebody had to fix them, so they weren't blind. And then, and then the the real reason was when I was in uh, school, I was playing sports, and I wore these thick black glasses. And uh, I kept breaking them in football. And so finally, my uh, eye doctor said, uh, you know, we're going to put you in contact lenses if you break them again. So I thought that was a great job. And then when I was in England for two years, I, I had the first uh, soft contacts that I ever bought. And the doctor there just really loved what he did. And, um, and I said, I made the comment, it seems like you really love your work. And he says, oh, don't get me started, mate. This is the best job in the world. Have you got any science background or interest? You should really become an eye doctor. And I thought, oh, as a commercial fisherman before that, and I thought, wow, uh, it just would, would be great. He says, when you get back to the States, he says, I should really recommend you look into this. So he really encouraged me. And, and I think that's something that all of us do that we don't really realize is that we inspire a lot of the younger students to go into our field and, and, um, and it, it helped me. And I think it's helped a lot of our students and, and residents. And uh, I was just checking for a book I'm writing that I've trained now 185 residents or fellows in, in my career. And it's fun to hear from them because uh, they're like your children, you know, <laughs> you just really love to see their success. Thank you, so interesting. Uh, the next question, uh, maybe, Connected with the previous uh, uh, question, Professor, do you have any suggestion for new ophthalmologists? What should we look for? How can we be great like you? Well, thanks for the compliment. I don't know that I'm great, but I think, uh, you know, the simple things, it, it's like in sports. People say, practice the fundamentals. You know, do the basic things. Practice your suturing. Practice uh, your incision. You know, if you can get uh, a practice eye or uh, some way to practice your capsulotomy, that's the most difficult part of cataract surgery they feel is the capsulotomy. The most dangerous part is the FACO. So if you can practice that, um, you know, by using a, a film from a cigarette wrapper or a, a saran wrap, they call it, a stretched uh, film, and just use a 25 gauge needle and some forceps and practice tearing circles in that and just spend the time to do that. Um, outside of that, I think you should practice doing something that you really enjoy. And uh, for me, it was oculoplastics and cataract surgery. And so for my first 10 years of practice, I did plastics and then uh, our insurance companies, Medicare quit paying or approving uh, blepharoplasty in advance. Uh, so I had to shift and that's when uh, refractive surgery came out. So I made the shift to that. It was brand new. And, and so I really enjoy those two areas, cataract and refractive surgery, but I still um, do plastics. Just yesterday, I put in a gold weight for the first time in 20 years and a lady who had paralytic lag of thalamus. So it's fun to have these other hobbies in ophthalmology. There's plenty of room to do things. Uh, and um I just think it's such a great specialty. I, I feel so fortunate to have been able to uh, train in this area and to benefit from all of my colleagues around the world who are open and share their pearls with us at these meetings. And I, I'm just really, uh, really appreciative of the feedback and interaction. My patients say, oh, isn't it wonderful that you go abroad and teach uh, all, your, all your skills? And I say, that's not really what happens. When I go abroad, I learn something every time from the local doctors, uh, like the jet wash technique, like uh, uh, treatment of pterygia from Ixan in, in Jakarta and different things that I'll take back and my patients benefit. So I'm, I'm really a, a big fan of uh, sharing information, of traveling and interacting with each other. And I think that's how we learn and that's how we uh, move the, the specialty forward. All right, <clears throat> the next question for the not technique, does it require special anesthesia, Professor? Uh, for the fisherman's knot? Yes. Yes, I would do it under a general anesthetic if at all possible. 
uh, because any little movement of the patient's head when you're suturing the iris uh, can be catastrophic. Um, I had one patient that moved when I had a, um, a bink horse cannula in the eye, jerked his head suddenly and the entire iris popped out of his eye. And so we had to put in a, um, a mortar iris uh, uh, IOL in that situation. So, um, you know, that it's just better to be prepared uh, when you go in. I think a general anesthetic or at least heavy IV sedation with a block is really essential because the patients will feel the iris more so than the cataract or the incision. And so if they feel uh, any pain or any uh, pressure on the iris, they'll jerk their head many times and that uh, can cause a catastrophe. The iris is like wet uh, toilet paper when you sew it, so you have to be very careful. All right. The last question, probably. Professor, were you happy to perform surgery in Indonesia? Yay. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Yes, that was, I think, probably one, the highlight of my ophthalmology career was when I was asked to perform uh, femto laser cataract surgery with a multifocal lens at the annual meeting of the Indonesian Ophthalmology Association a few years back. And uh, they gave me 20 minutes to do the surgery live in front of the whole audience. It was a little bit nerve wracking, but I, I uh, had great uh, surgical assistant nurse and we rehearsed what we were going to do ahead of time. And I think we completed that case in about seven or eight minutes. <laughs> and so uh, fortunately it worked out well and they did good patient selection and the patient could see right away. And it was really, uh, one of the real highlights of my career. And I'm very grateful to have been invited over many times. And I would just like to say at the end here that if any of you around the world have an opportunity to attend one of the Indonesian meetings, uh, it is my favorite one to attend, even more so than the American Academy or the ASCRS uh, or the European Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Indo Indonesian meetings are just wonderful. They, they have the latest uh, technology and, uh, and they have the best social programs of any meeting. Thank you so much, Professor. So exceptional, more than 20 questions have been answered by our super maestro at this very moment. Great speaker, great audiences. So phenomenal, you all rock. Here we are spreading love, care, peace, and tranquility on earth. Thank you, SMEC Group. Thank you, ID. Thank you, Kodami Sumut. <clears throat> thank you, Anak Sudarti Foundation. Thank you, all committee. And thank you, all our distinguished participants. And to our maestro, Dr. John Jarstad, my American brother, please send our regard to your family and to your proud grandchildren as well. Thank you so much, John. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Terima kasih, Bapak Profesor. You are absolutely great. Anda hebat. Sama-sama. <laughs> Terima kasih. So our distinguished participant, tomorrow morning, the webinar will be delivered in Bahasa Indonesia. We will have Dr. Laksono Bagus Aspito, specialist mata consultant, with his lecture, step-by-step -step and fundamental VECO for every level surgeon, VECO course. And next month will be with uh, another American, Dr. John Hopanisian from California. So you can find the links on the chat box. The link also will be sent via email to your email address. The certificate will be sent hopefully before two weeks. Hopefully before two weeks. Your participation is highly appreciated. appreciated. See you all. Thank you so much. All of our great friends from all around the world. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Thank you, John. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll say now. Selamat pagi. Selamat malam. Terima kasih.